So uh, what did we talk about last time? So last time we did a bunch of LQR. So we did kind of like LQR as a QP. And then we use that to kind of bootstrap our way into talking about this like Riccati recursion um, and saw, you know, how that's uh, a way of sort of taking advantage of the block sparsity in the QP to solve it fast. It's also though, there's way more going on there. So we're going to do a little bit more of a dive into the the depths there. So one of, in particular, right, we, we kind of hinted somehow out of that, you get a feedback policy right? That's applicable to like any initial condition, which is kind of wild. And so we're going to kind of dig into like, there's more going on there. Uh, and we're going to, we're going to kind of explore that a little bit today and and see yet another way to look at LQR and another kind of viewpoint on it. Um, and that kind of explains that whole feedback policy story. So today, what we're going to do is um, a little bit of cleanup from last time on a couple little points. The first one is we're going to talk for a, a real quick second about the infinite horizon uh, LQR problem, which uh, we kind of hinted at last time with this whole thing about like the K matrix, like asymptoting out to a constant K after you go back for a little while. And that's that's called the infinite horizon solution. So we're gonna talk about that in some a little bit more detail today. Then that's gonna, there's, then we're gonna talk a little bit more again, cleaning up some loose ends on the LQR story about this idea of controllability. Has anyone heard of this before? In like a linear systems class, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, and then we're going to get into dynamic programming, which is a, a very deep subject and will give us yet another way to get at LQR. So that's four ways to do LQR at the end of this. And that'll kind of lead us into a whole bunch of other stuff uh, that we'll kind of then continue with next time. And who's done dynamic programming before? Good number. It's very like, very strong in the RL world and, and like other areas of computer science too. So that's a big one. All right, cool. Uh, so let's do it. Uh, so first thing is to kind of like just tie up the loose ends on this infinite uh, horizon story. And so, yeah, it's, it's obviously this like limiting case of you have a very long time horizon and we saw how that stuff asymptotically becomes constant. And so to just kind of explain that a little more for Time invariant LQR problems. This is only a thing for time invariant. Because obviously for time varying stuff, things got to change all the time. Time invariant LQR, as we saw, right, the K matrices. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, no. K matrices um, converge to constant values. And what we kind of said last time is that for stabilization problems, so like if you're just like, you know, balancing, you know, the cart pull or whatever, um, we usually just use that constant K and that's kind of it. And actually, um, all the toolboxes you're probably familiar with, like MATLAB, you know, uh, Julia, Python toolboxes, the control toolboxes have a function for like LQR, DLQR, where you put an A, B, Q, and R, and it spits out a K matrix. And in fact, that is the infinite horizon K matrix. And what we're gonna talk about right now is how how that how they get that, right? So remember what we were doing uh, last time, we got this like backward recursion thing, which is called the Riccati recursion. Um, and for the P's and the K's, and it looks like this, we've got, we saw for the K, and this is just from last time. I'm just gonna write it real quick. It's a little ugly, but you will see this enough times that hopefully it starts to kind of stick. Um, so that's the K part, and then the P part, you plug, you do that one, then you plug it into the second one, and you get an equation for P and you just kind of alternate these guys. And this is, remember, the time invariant case. So the A's and the B's and the Q's and the R's are const or fixed matrices that don't have time indices. Okay, so we do this backwards. 
and we said, you know, we iterated this backwards a whole bunch and we got constants. Um, so in the infinite horizon limit, what we're really saying is that pk plus one equals pk equals some like p infinity, right? So it's saying like, when I do that recursion, I get back the same thing, right? Does that sound familiar to anyone? Talking about like a whole bunch of stuff we talked about really early in the class. Hey, yes, that's a fixed point iteration. So it turns out that the Riccati equation in the LTI case has a stable fixed point, which is the infinite horizon value. And in fact, one way to solve for the infinite horizon K is to just do fixed point iteration. I, you just run Riccati a whole bunch until it goes out to some constant and there you go. But we talked about, you know, fixed point iteration and eh, kind of slow, whatever. So there's maybe other ways to do it. And in fact, you know, there are, and the toolboxes that do this, pretty much none of them do it as a fixed point iteration problem because that can converge super slow in some cases and stuff like that. So another way to do this is it's just, you can, you know, move things over to one side, set it equal to zero and have a root finding problem and use Newton on it also, right? So you can also solve this as a um, root finding or fixed point problem. And um, most of the toolboxes like do some variation on that. So there, there are very, there's kind of fancy or more specialized techniques for Riccati equations because they're so common and show up so much uh, that there's like kind of fancy ways to do it. But like a reasonable thing to do is to run the fixed point thing for a while and then do like an, a single Newton, a couple Newton steps and you'll get the answer to like super high accuracy. Um, so yeah, then because the Newton method uh, will have some finite basin of attraction and if you have a good enough initial guess, it, it will not converge very well. So a reasonable approach would be to run the fixed point iteration for a little while. And then uh, this is a common strategy, by the way, in a lot of numerical methods. You, If you have some slowly converging thing, um, but that's super stable or whatever, you run that for a while. And then you do what's called solution polishing, which is where you do like one or two rounds of Newton. Because Newton can get you like a super tight, you know, exact answer, essentially. Um, and so that's like a, a common, so like doing something else and then like doing one or two Newton solves at the end, it's called solution polishing. It's super common in a lot of sort of numerical algorithms. Uh, so yeah, basically, uh, there's toolboxes that do this for you, right? So Julia, MATLAB, all of the things, Python, uh, control toolboxes call this dare, uh, specifically. DARE stands for discrete algebraic Riccati equation. That gives you the P. So DARE will give you the P and then DLQR, it will give you the K. And there's functions for both of these. And yeah, so any any of the control boxes, toolboxes will help with this. Cool. And we'll do some examples of that. That's, so that's super useful. So now you know infinite horizon LQR. If you have a stabilization problem where you just care about like balancing or you know kind of keeping your system at some fixed point, write down linearize about the fixed point A and D, make up some costs. You can tune them a little bit. Just call DLQR or whatever, and you'll get your infinite horizon K. And now you, there you go. Uh, okay. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yeah. For reference, for if you're doing trajectory tracking, tracking some reference, like then you want the Time varying LQR. And then you write down a whole you know, series of A's and B's and you do the full Riccati thing and cache everything. Yeah. And then when you're doing it, when you're doing your rollouts, you run the K's at the correct time and whatever. Yeah. So you're going to do this stuff on homework, promise. But yeah, that's kind of the, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, we're going to do it. it. It is important. It comes, it's useful. Not for that case, but it becomes super useful when you're doing MPC. As soon as we start talking about like constraints and solving the optimization problems online, then we're going to use the P. And we're going to start getting into how that looks today with a little bit of a, a story there. Okay, cool. So uh, the next story is controllability. This is again, some loose ends on the LQR story. So the basic thing here that we're trying to get at is how do we know like 
if LQR will work? Um, and specifically, how do we know if it uh, if it can stabilize the system? Right. So we already heard, like, so so far, right? We already like talked a bunch about how um, we have some conditions on Q and R, right? Specifically, we need Q to be positive semi-definite and R to be strictly positive definite. And those are basically to ensure convexity, to ensure that that QP has a unique minimum so that like the solution, like it's a well-posed QP. So that's still, we got that. It turns out though, there's also conditions on the dynamics in this context, the A and B matrices, uh, such that the system, and we call those controllability conditions. Basically, is it even possible, right? So you could make up a system that has like, 10 degrees of freedom, but one control input, and it's just going to face plant because you just don't have enough control authority to balance it, right? Because you don't have enough knobs, you don't have enough control inputs. That we would call that an uncontrollable system, right? And in that case, you, LQR is not going to work. So this is about like conditions on the system matrices, the system dynamics, uh, such that we we will be able to you know control it. Uh, so for specifically for LTI, so this is a, a, a general kind of topic. For linear systems, there's nice ways to compute this and like be confident in it. For nonlinear systems, it's a complicated story in general. But for linear systems, there's nice ways to do it. For LTI systems, linear time invariant, where it's fixed A and B, then there's like a really clean closed form version of it that we can do right, right now. So let's do that. And we'll talk a little bit about some of the other cases after. Okay. So there's a nice, simple, basic closed floor answer. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to write down kind of a little uh, trajectory from some initial state. So for any initial state, x naught, um, some later time state xn is given by the following. So this is literally, I'm just gonna iterate the dynamics. So I've got Xn equals A times Xn minus one plus B times Un minus one. And if I go back another time step, I can write that is A times X minus two, but I'm gonna nest this. Uh, so it's gonna be A times uh, minus two plus B times U N minus Q uh, plus B times U N minus one, right? So and so on going this. So I can keep nesting the dynamics in from earlier time steps. And if I kind of just do that all the way back in time, I'm going to get something that looks like this. I've got like A to the N X naught plus A to the N minus one B U naught plus a to the n minus two uh, u uh, one plus dot 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 b u n minus one. So I can like, so the whole idea here is I want to eliminate all the states. So I've just written this out so that um, I I keep plugging in like a x plus b u everywhere uh, uh, recursively backwards for the x's, and so I can write this whole thing. So that I just get it in terms of the initial state x naught. That makes sense. So literally, what this is is like me expanding out a rollout from x naught. So I give you an x naught and all the u's, and I just iterate the dynamics a whole bunch. This is it, right, for a linear system. Does that makes sense, everybody. Okay, so I can like now take that whole thing and squish it into a big matrix equation that looks like this. So I've got b. A times B squared times B dot 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 all the way to A one times B. This guy times all the controls stacked up. So it'd be like U N minus one, U N minus two, dot dot dot. Okay, U not. Stack all the controls in a big vector, um, plus the initial condition. So that looks like A to the N. Everyone cool with that? Okay, so now if I look at this, um, this is like a big weird linear system. And specifically, 
Like if I were to give you a problem, like what's the shape of this matrix? Like uh, the my mouse here, yeah. So like this matrix here. So like the left hand side here is x n. So it's a, a state vector. Um, so whatever that is, right, n dimensional. And then this guy though is like all the u's for all time stacked up. So this is a huge vector on the right, a little vector on the left. So what shape is this matrix? Short and fat, right? Short and fat matrix. So what kind of problem is this if I were to give you like a linear system like this? It is a an underdetermined linear system, right? And there's sort of an infinite number of possible solutions to this. So what do you usually do in a situation like this? You want to get a solution. The least squares problem. We can find a least square solution to this. Everyone remember this? Yeah. Cool. So then we remember like how you would get a least square solution of this guy. Huh? Okay. Uh, you could. That's a very kind of brute forcey, expensive way to do it, but not wrong. Uh, there's a there's a like sort of cheapo, sort of normal way to do this. Uh, and normal being actually a hint. Uh, this is uh, called the uh, pseudo inverse. It's also called the normal equations in uh, least squares. So I'll show you what this is. If is this jogging any memories, you guys heard this before? Yeah. Okay. So um, this is a, a least squares problem. Or like the u trajectory for u here one and we can write it like this if i wanted to solve for all those u's i could write like u n minus one u n u dot 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 u naught um equals and then this is the the least square z trick so that thing let's call this big matrix over here c which is actually another hint call that big c so if i were to do the least squares thing um, I'll just write it and then we can talk about it a little bit. Um, here's what this looks like. I'm sure you guys have seen this before at some point in your lives. Um, and then I, basically all I'm doing here is I'm solving for the U trajectory and putting also over the right. So the stuff then on the right hand side just ends up being X minus A to the N. So this is like, if I give you any X naught and any XN, and it's an LTI system, I can like write this down as a big least squares problem. That's the answer, right? Everyone cool with that? Okay, so yeah, do we remember this thing in the brackets here, what this is called? It's called a pseudo inverse. You guys seen this? Also called the Moore Penrose pseudo inverse. Uh, so pseudo inverse. Um, by the way, you should never actually do this. this is like bad for you. Uh, in particular, if anyone's like done some more hard work, right? so squaring C like this and then inverting it is a bad idea uh, because it gets ill conditioned. Uh, so does anyone know what you're supposed to do there? The SVD is actually a way to do it without squaring, but but it's more. There's a cheaper way to do it. Does anyone know what the like correct way to do this is? Yeah, you can do that. Do you know what that does under the hood, though? Uh, it does a QR factorization. So there's a clever way to do this where you take the QR factorization of C or C transpose, and like then you don't have to square C. Um, if you want, I'm sure, I think Kevin might talk about this in his office hours uh, some more, uh, like how you get to this. Um, hoping you've seen this in some linear algebra class, but yeah. The trick which, to get this is literally you basically, you write this down, C is not square. You multiply both sides by C transpose or whatever you get that thing, which is square now, like vertical. So the key idea here is this guy. Okay, so that's that. So what do I need here to make this problem solvable? That's the key question. Can you give me a condition on C for this thing to be have a solution? Yeah, so specifically, I need to convert Inside the inverse, so I need that CC transpose matrix to be full rank. What uh, dimension is that thing? 
that CC transpose thing. It's n by n where n is the state size of the state, right? So it's so CC transpose needs to be invertible. Got it's an n by n matrix where n is the state dimension. So you can equivalently say that the big C matrix needs to be rank n where n is the state dimension, right? Everyone cool with that? Let's write that down. Um, so for C C transpose to be vertible, we need rank C to be equal to N, where N equals the dimension of X. Cool? Everyone, that's, everyone cool with that? Yeah? All right. So that's sort of, you know, like sophomore linear algebra stuff. Um, there's now there's a little bit of a extra leap that's like a little less sophomore level linear algebra. It's maybe like a grad level linear algebra. Okay, so it turns out that so this we just wrote this out for like some generic big trajectory, right? Like n big n time steps could be whatever. And so you get this big C matrix that can be arbitrarily big. How do I like so in principle, like do I have to do this forever? Like can I how do I know like I can actually do this for like some reasonable size C. Can I stop at some point? Do I have to take this out for infinite horizon to like call like calculate control? So it turns out you can stop after little n number of time steps. And the reason why is a little subtle. Um, do you know? Yeah. So I just wrote this thing out. I just wrote out like if I started some x naught and I simulate forward some, some number of time steps, and I get to some xn. Yeah, I just wrote that out. So that's like an arbitrary number of time steps, right? And what I did is I wrote down this like least squares problem to solve for all the u's. So this is like an arbitrary length of time, right? So we're like this right here, this, this thing, some big n number of times. You know, time steps, it could be an I don't know. Right. So the question now is like if it has to be a like I can't solve this problem, it's gotta be a million time steps, right? Like that doesn't really help me. Uh and we're talking about infinite horizon LQR here, right? So does that have to be an infinite number of time steps? If that's the case, then it's an easy, right? So can I solve this for like a finite number of time steps and be able to say it's controllable? Does that make sense? That's what I'm after right now. Is everyone clear on that? Okay, and so the answer is you can, while we're talking about it, because it's actually useful, and you can do it with a finite number of time steps. And so here's, I'll just say it, and like then we can talk about it. So it turns out um, when I check this thing for the rank, I can stop at a, at, um, I can stop at in little n uh, time steps. which is the state dimension in that uh, C matrix. And the reason is the following thing that is non-trivial. And uh, so it's because so when I'm calculating this C, what's showing up in there, like it's B, and then it's B or like, so if I take it for longer, I just get higher and higher powers of A. Yeah, you know, let's, you want to say it? Yeah, so another way to say this, you're right, yes. So it's it's like a power iteration type thing, right? It turns out there's a clean result called the Cayley-Hamilton theorem. You heard of this? You ever heard of this before? Okay, so um, basically what that says, um, Says that a uh, to the n for like a large n can be written in terms of a linear combination of lower powers of a 
uh, like up to little n, where n's the, the dimension of a. So it says basically this, like a to the big n equals some sum uh, from like k equals zero to uh, little n minus one with some coefficients alpha, like a to the n for some alpha. Uh, there's a bunch of like related results to this. Uh, this so it's another way to say this is like a to the big n is like a matrix polynomial in you know a itself up to only a little n. Uh, the other way to say this is that a solves its own characteristic equation. You heard that where the characteristic equation is like this equation for finding like the eigenvalues uh, for a matrix. I don't know. This one's on Wikipedia. You can look it up. Uh, it's not a like absolutely key thing. All this says is that for an LTI system. When we're trying to check this controllability thing, we can stop at little n. And that's all we need to do. Little n time steps. Basically, it says if it's not controllable after little n time steps, it's never going to be controlled. You can only check up to that. OK, so basically, we're checking rank, right? So what this is really saying is adding more time steps or right to our C uh, can't increase the rank anymore. And so uh, what we're going to do then is define this C to be what we just wrote down. But for any given system, it's only going to go up to A to the N minus 1 inside there, uh, where N minus 1, that little n state dimension. And this thing has a name. If you go like look at the books and stuff, uh, this is called the controllability matrix. You haven't seen this before? Yeah, cool. So that's kind of how you get it. Okay. Fun fact, uh, we're not really do this too much, but what do you do in the LTV case? Yeah, so in the LTV case, basically you don't have a result like this you basically just have to check it for the whole trajectory. So if you're doing LTV and it's a finite horizon, you just have to check the whole trajectory. You can do it this way, um, in which case, has anyone heard of controllability Gramian before? Yeah? That's transfer. So it turns out for the LTV case, you just have to write out the whole trajectory of all the time during A's and B's. Write out a big C. CP transfer is a check for A. Um, you shouldn't. You shouldn't do C transfer the rank of C again, but you have to do it for the whole trajectory. There's no shortcut in the LTV case. But fun fact, that CC transfer thing is the controllability Grammy, and if you've heard of that before, uh, that's a, it's just a name. It's not It's not useful, by the way. You should never actually compute it. It's a bad idea. Yeah, so, I mean, like, you can say things like this. It's it's iffy, right? So like, I mean, it's really just a binary rank thing. Like it's either controllable or not. Like looking at it in sort of like relative terms, like how, you know, magnitude wise, it's kind of, because like you can always basically do a change of units or something that'll totally change those numbers, right? If I rescale my units, like it'll change all those values. So I, I would argue like the relative like magnitude of that thing is not actually very informative because it's kind of based on your unit choices and stuff which are arbitrary, right? So it's really just this like rank condition. The issue is this Brannian thing, because it's like squared. And if you're doing it for really long, it has the classic like, you know, tail wagging the dog kind of problem. It gets super ill conditioned and like the rank stuff is almost useless uh, from a numerical perspective. So uh, don't do it. <laughs> okay, cool. So that's that. Any other questions about this stuff? Okay, cool. So that is kind of the end of our initial foray into LQR topics and like linear systems e topics. Uh, has anyone here taken a linear systems theory course, by the way? I know there's a couple in CMU, yeah. That's usually like a good idea if you really care about controls. Uh, basically, it's an entire semester course in like stuff like this, like controllability, grammings, like matrix math of various flavors that are useful for this stuff. So if you haven't done that, might be a good idea if you, if you like this stuff and want to spend more time with it. Okay. Thus ends this topic. We're, we're going to switch gears a little bit.
So any last questions about any of this stuff? Okay, cool. So now we're going to talk about is Bellman's principle. We're going to switch gears now and talk about dynamic programming. Who's heard of this before? Only a couple people. Okay, interesting. Um, all right, so here's what this is about. Uh, so this is like a really, really core like RL, like kind of optimal control topic. It shows up all over the place. And like, it's a very intuitive idea. So the, the idea is that like optimal control problems um, have like an inherently sequential structure to them. Like basically things happen in through time. And like really all this is, is that like the arrow of time, basically saying that like past actions affect, can only like actions can only affect future times. They can't affect the past, right? It's literally just that at its heart, right? So it's a pretty intuitive idea. Um, but that has interesting like math repercussions. Uh, so yeah, said like very simply, like past uh, control moves uh, only affect future states. And future control moves, future inputs can't affect the past, can't affect past states. So this is like painfully obvious. Um, and so that, that fact is called Bellman's principle, also known as the principle of optimality. It seems like so trivial that it almost like shouldn't have this like grandiose name. I think it's a little awkward that it does, but um, it has lots of interesting kind of, if you follow the rabbit hole a little deeper, there's interesting things. So this is called Bellman's principle or principle of optimality uh, states the consequences of this basically. of this for optimal trajectories for like optimal control problems. And literally like this is an entire subject. It's just that, that's the whole thing. Uh, okay, so like the way to say this, I guess, um, maybe I'll move to a new page for this, we're gonna draw a picture. So let's say I have a trajectory and I'll just like cartoon a thing out here real quick. Let's say this is time and this is like X. Let's say we've got, you know, really, Sort of trivial 1D thing. This is X naught. Let's say we just like are wiggling around, you know, and that like here's, you know, XN over here, say. So that's our trajectory. So what this is saying is that like, I need to make this wiggle. Uh, so if I were to pick some like random point on this trajectory, like say halfway through, like say here, like this is some XK in the middle. If I were to write down a new trajectory optimization, a new optimal control problem starting from xk instead of x naught. What the what this says is just that like if I start there, the answer to that sub trajectory problem has to be the a sub trajectory of the bigger problem. Like because obviously let's say you know hypothetically if, if I were to solve this problem and get like another answer that went like this, if that somehow had lower cost, I would have taken that path on the bigger problem because that would have made the bigger problem have lower cost. Does that make sense to everybody? It's very obvious that, that like, you know, shouldn't be as big a deal as it is maybe. I don't know. But, uh, you know, it is a big deal. Okay, so that's cool. Everyone's got that. So, yeah, so let's summarize this. Basically, if this path uh, had lower cost for the short problem, Um, I would have taken it starting from X naught.
Okay, so further to labor this, I'll just say, um, so another way to say this is sub trajectories of optimal trajectories have to be uh, optimal trajectories for like the appropriately defined sub problem, like starting from that, you know, state. Okay, so I've said that now like three different ways. I'm drawing a picture. It might take a little bit longer to stick, but that's sort of the idea. Okay, so that idea uh, kind of cues up this whole line of stuff called dynamic programming, uh, which we're now going to talk about. And basically, the idea is, um, given that fact, and we've seen hints of this already, uh, if that's true, then it means like if I it kind of implies that you should start at the end and work your way backwards, right? Because if that's true, then like if I start at the goal, I can take like one little step backwards and solve a really easy little problem. And then I can take another step back. And if I know the tail solution, now I can solve another little problem to connect to that. And then they're back and back, right? So it sort of implies this sort of backwards recursion starting at the goal, which you know, we've seen before in that whole Riccati thing and in the back the like backward Riccati iteration, also like the backward, like back propagation labored uh, gradient pass in the Pantriagin stuff, right? So this idea of like going backward from the tail or from the, the goal is, is kind of where this is heading. So let's write that down. Uh, this sort of, um, Suggest starting from the end of trajectory and working backwards. Um, and yeah, as I said, we've already seen some hints of this. from the uh, Riccati stuff. Um, okay, so here's how we're gonna do this. Uh, the move now is we're gonna make some stuff up. We're gonna define this thing called the optimal cost to go, your control person, that's what it's called. If you do an RL, this is called the value function. Personally, I like cost to go better than value function because value function seems very vague and meaningless to me, whereas cost to go kind of has like a real meaning to it which will be clear in a second, but you know, whatever you want to call it, it's cool. Uh, so we're gonna define this thing. And who's, yeah, who's done this stuff before? Quick show of hands. You've seen value functions before somewhere. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll... So, cost to go, AKA value function, pretty terrible, value function. And we're going to call this v of x. Uh, in, in general, we'll have a time step on it, so vk of x. And the idea is, in words, what this thing is doing is this function will tell you the cost that it will take you to get to the goal starting at that x at time k. So I have this function. If I know this function, if I want to know the cost to get from any initial condition to the goal, I plug it in this function, it tells me that optimal. Does that make sense? I got that. So it, it tells me the cost. If I if I knew the optimal solution from any initial conditions, whatever, it kind of wraps all that up into this one function that I can query. I can give it a time and a state, and it'll tell me the, the best I can do, right, in terms of the cost to get to the goal from there. Make sense, everybody? So encodes cost incurred. Starting from state x at time k 
uh, if we act optimal, act, uh, act optimally. Okay, so that's the definition. So now we're going to go do this for the LQR problem, sort of see how it works out. Okay, I think this is a new page situation again. Here we go. Okay, ready? So for LQR, what we do is we're going to start at the end. So that's going to be V sub N of X. And so remember in LQR, we had this cost function. We had the stage cost, which is over the X's and the U's. And then we have this terminal cost. So what do we think this cost to go thing is at time N at the end? It's just the terminal cost because I can't do anything else, right? So basically by construction for LQR, this cost to go thing at the final time is just wherever you are there plugged into that terminal cost because you literally can't do anything about it. So that's it. Okay, that makes sense, everybody. So if, if I say time's up, here's where you are. There's no moves left. It's just that cost. That's that's the cost you've got. You have nothing you can do about it. Okay, so that's the terminal cost. That's so we work backwards. The cost to go at time n for LQR is just the terminal cost. And we're going to just define this thing um, to be. This is a, another hint. So we're going to call the the matrix that shows up in our cost to go, the cost to go for, uh, this is not like a super big you know, giveaway. For LQR, the cost to go is always a quadratic function. So what we're gonna do is we're just gonna write it as a quadratic function and we're gonna compute it going backwards with this Bellman thing. Um, and we're gonna uh, always define like the weight matrix that shows up in there as P. So it'll be P sub K or V sub K, right? So it's gonna look like this. So for time N, it's P sub N and P sub n is defined just like by construction to be Q sub n. It's just that terminal cost Hessian thing. Okay, cool. So that's the, the, the final step. Now what we're going to do is back up one step and calculate V sub n minus one. Okay, so here's how we do that. V n minus one is going to be min over u. And what I'm going to do is basically write down the one step cost, that stage cost, for time n minus one. So that's uh, x on transpose q. And I'm going to do this, I guess, for LTI, so I can write fewer subscripts, but it's the same stuff. If you want to put subscripts on, you can. Uh, u transpose r u. That's the stage cost for time n minus one. And then to get a tail in there, I take the dynamics and plug them into the value function. So if I, if I know Vn for the next time step, I can plug in the dynamics so I can write this all in terms of the current time step. So maybe to be, I'll write these guys down. The reason I did this, right, is Remember that Vn is a function of xn. And to write this all at time n minus one, I can just plug in the time. Right? Everyone got that? So now this is all in terms of uh, un minus one, xn minus one, and Vn, right? So this lets me go backwards. Um, so now what I'm going to do is solve this guy. Um, let's draw. We're going to come back to this later. So we'll take a little shortcut or a little like detour, I'm gonna just solve that min problem right now. So this thing is a quadratic, it's all nice because we picked everything to be convex. So so I can find the min of this thing. It's just a quadratic. I can find the min by just setting the gradient equal to zero. So let's do that real quick. So um, next step is I'm gonna plug in the definition of Vn here. So this is over u. Uh, the x term does nothing because I'm minimizing over u. So that X term like drops out, right? When I take the gradient, it doesn't go up. So we're going to drop that term real quick. It'll come back in a second. For this part, it doesn't matter. So I've got this term, and then I'm going to expand that cost to go term with the dynamics. So I've got A X plus B 
transpose en, and then you know ax plus bu. Cool. So I take the gradient of this thing and set it equal to zero. That gives me R plus B transpose E N A one plus B equals zero. And then I can like rearrange this and solve for U. So U N minus one is gonna be minus R. I guess I, I'm being inconsistent about the subscript, but you know, we're going to deal with it to save me writing and so you don't have to suffer through my ends that look like K's and stuff. You know. so if these are N minus one, uh, inverse the one times N minus one. Okay, that's kind of a mess. So what we're going to do now, though, uh, and it should start jogging your memory for things we did last time, this whole thing in front of the x is going to be called k n minus 1. This is starting to look familiar. And now what we're going to do, we're going to just take that and plug it back in. So we did the min. We're going to go ahead and plug it back in minus 1 there. So uh, I guess star on this guy. A little detour, and then we're gonna plug this back in. Uh, specifically, plug u equals minus k x uh, back into star, and what that gets you is v n minus one of x equals. So I kind of just like stuff all that together, I'm going to get one half x transpose, and I'm going to get this giant matrix q plus k transpose minus k plus a minus k transpose e and a minus k, all in a big bracket, times x. And what do you know? So this is now vn minus 1. Look at if, if same some giant matrix X, and we're going to call that giant matrix in the middle E n minus one. Starting to look very familiar. So now we've got uh, V n minus one of X equals one half X transpose E n minus one. So now, like we've seen before, we've got this recursion. For k and p, we start at time n, get some k n minus one, p n minus one, and now we bootstrap and we keep going all the way back to time to t zero. So little k for times dev equals zero, whatever. And what do we think this thing is? The Riccati equation again. So we got the Riccati equation before by looking at like matrix sparsity and back substitution. And now we're seeing that it's actually um, dynamic programming. It's actually doing the Bellman recursion on this dynamic programming formulation of the problem. And uh, Last time we, we got these K's and P's kind of randomly and we didn't know what the P's were. The K's are like the feedback gains. So the K's are the feedback policy that we get with dynamic programming. The P's are the Hessian of the cost to go. That makes sense, everybody? The cost to go, in the case of LQR, the cost to go is a quadratic function always. And it turns out the P is the Hessian. Okay, is that cool with everybody? Any questions about any of this? So yeah, I'd suggest like don't sweat the details of the linear algebra stuff too much. You should you should do it so you like kind of do the gymnastics yourself. That's just like you know 
that's like grammar, right? It's like stressing about like, I don't know, English grammar. It's not the story, right? You should know the story, but you got to speak English too. You got to know your grammar too. Like linear algebra is like the grammar, right? Okay, so to summarize that whole thing, um, for like more general case, So we did it for the special case of the LQR problem, but in general, for any problem, it looks like this. So we start with Vn of x uh, is our terminal cost. Remember, we wrote down that control problem. We've got a stage cost, a terminal cost, and some non in general nonlinear dynamics, arbitrary cost. So when you do this on an arbitrary problem, the cost to go is initialized at time n with just the terminal cost. Uh, we set our time step k equal to n, and then we end up with this backward recursion. It looks like this, while uh, while k not one, um, we're going to get v k minus one of x is equal to min over u. And I'll write it like this, just meaning we're going to minimize it with within the bounds on u, right? So if you got control limits, whatever you, you put those in, min over u of the stage cost for that time step plus the cost to go for the, the next time step in the future with the dynamics plugged in. So if I have Vn back up one step, I put in the stage cost, I plug the dynamics into that cost to go from time in, I minimize over u and I get once I min over u, right, now the u's are gone and it's just a function of x, right? And that gets me the, the v at the next time step. Then well, after I do that, I just kind of decrement k and keep going all the way back. Cool? So here's, so that's the general case. Um, if you somehow magically know the cost to go for a given problem, and this is getting into where the p's are useful for, for other things. Um, if you know the cost to go, there's a sense in which knowing v of x encodes like everything there is to know about an optimal control problem. Like if you have v, you have everything. And you just like, you've solved the problem. And this is kind of why. Uh, if you have v, the optimal control policy is u k of x equals argument over u subject to the control limits, right? Of your stage cost plus your cost to go. Basically what this is saying is if I know the cost to go, Instead of having to solve this monster trajectory optimization problem over some big horizon, I literally can solve a little single one-step problem over one control move. And this gives me the optimal solution. Does that make sense? This person L that's calling that the stage cost. Yeah, the stage cost, the one-step cost. That's the thing inside the sum from our formulation of the whole problem from like last time. Terminal cost is little is L sub n. And the terminal cost is just a function of x because it's at the end and we have no more. This is the cost you get at every time step. And you sum up the little L's for all the time steps to get the same. Total cost is sum of those L's for all the time steps plus the sum. Yeah. Yeah, you can do that here too. That just corresponds to um I mean, you can pull that into the L if you want, actually. That's literally just a particular choice of L. It's putting like a decaying, you know, e to the something, negative something factor in front of the stage cost at every time step, right? So yeah, you can like, if you if you want, you could define L as a function of T or as like L sub K or whatever and wrap that into L. Uh, that happens in optimal control too. You, if you want, you can do it that way. It's just a choice of cost function.
yeah, literally it's put a minus sign in front of it and maximize instead of, yeah, it's the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. So this would be called the like one step reward, one step cost, stage cost, stage, like it's the same thing. Yeah. Literally just flip the sign and call it a reward if you want. Uh, yeah. Does that make sense? Cool. Anybody else? So this is this is how you would find the cost to go. This is like a recursion to find the cost to go. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. So that's how we would find V. And this thing, if you know V, then we can find the optimal U at any time by just solving the step normalization problem. Yeah, makes sense. Okay. So uh for all the RL people in the room, um we can equivalently state this whole thing, um, this whole dynamic programming thing. Uh, in terms of this other function uh, called the action value function, or uh, somewhat annoyingly, uh, Q function. And we're not going to call it the Q function because we're already using Q for LQR for like the cost weights and stuff. And it's just annoying to overload notation. So we're going to call it S. Since I'm picking the next letter that's not overloaded. Um, so what this thing is, we'll call the S function. S of X and U. And literally what it is, is just the, the whole term inside that R. So it's the cost to go with the dynamics plugged in plus the stage cost. So it's L plus the A plus one with the F plugged in. That So that's called the action value function. It's usually denoted U of X comma U. Um, but we'll use that to avoid overloading like the LQR notation. Why would you want to do this? For the RL people. There's someone has seen this before now. Because the reason that people in RL like this is that if I learn S instead of V, if I know V, then I still need the dynamics, right? So if I if I know V. Solve this minimum is a problem where I have to actually plug the F the dynamics model into V. If I'm doing RL and I want to be model free and not have a model at all, if I directly learn this S thing instead of V, now this X, if I can learn this thing directly, it includes the dynamics sort of implicitly inside it, and I don't need to learn a dynamics model separately. So it kind of squishes the cost to go and the dynamics together into one big function. Does that make sense? So that's why if you're doing model free RL, you'd probably do a Q function E, you know, action value thing instead of a value function. But, you know, you could also like learn the dynamics and the value function separately or whatever. It's sort of that that's the why. So this can avoid uh a need for an explicit dynamics model. Okay, so this is like kind of the, the basic story for dynamic programming. It's uh, it's a very deep topic. There's all kinds of stuff to say about this. But um, now we have to talk about the curse. Unfortunately, that's what it's called. I didn't make that up. Uh, the, the, unfortunately, dynamic programming is cursed. Um, so there's a bunch of cool things to say about this, right? So first of all is um, all the stuff we talked about so far, the Pontryagin stuff, the uh, like trajectory optimization -y stuff. Uh, we've so far mostly been doing like LQR stuff, which is globally optimal because it's a convex problem. But in general, if I do like the Pontryagin-y stuff, if I do this like, you know, uh, all the optimization stuff we talked about, it's only finding you a local optimum, right? It turns out though, if I, if I can do it, um, dynamic programming actually uh, gives me the global optimum if I can do it, right? So that's super cool. It's actually a sufficient condition, 
not just it. So remember, when we did all this optimization stuff, everything we talked about were first order necessary conditions, necessary conditions. So they're just good for a local optimum. It turns out this thing gives you the global solution, which is awesome. So you'd think maybe we'd like to do this all the time, but um, we can't, and this is the curse. Uh, so the 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 issue is that this whole scheme is only really tractable for like really simple problems. In particular, it's always tractable for LQR problems. We just did it. It's also tractable for very low dimensional nonlinear problems where you can basically like grid the state space and like kind of, and the key reason is that in this backward recursion thing here, we're calculating, we're solving. In the case of LQR, it just so happens that function is quadratic. And therefore, to like represent the function, we just need to like keep track of one matrix, right? That P matrix. But if for a gen, even if the cost is quadratic, if I'm talking about a general non system, I'm nesting this nonlinear nasty dynamics function in here. And it's actually a recursion, right? So every time I go backwards, it's like F of F of F for some really nonlinear gross dynamics. So this function can be like arbitrarily gross, arbitrarily nonlinear. And it's high dimensional, right? So if I'm doing this for a big robot, like I'm doing this for like a humanoid, this is like an 80 dimensional nonlinear. This is literally a, like a 80 dimensional nonlinear partial differential equation, right? It's the worst thing you can imagine trying to do. So um, the, the key issue is I can write that down, but I uh, for high dimensional problems, I literally, I just have no way of representing V for an arbitrarily nasty nonlinear function. So you can kind of guess where this is going, right? So I, I can't do it in general because I can't write down V in a like reasonably compact way. Uh, so let's see. We can do it for LQR and we can do it for like low dimensional problems. Um, and kind of the core reason is that V is quadratic for LQR. But basically, uh, becomes impossible to write down. Uh, even for like relatively benign seeming nonlinear problems. Okay, uh, let's see. And yeah, then the other thing to say about this, even if we hypothetically could write down this V, um, the uh, the little problem, the little like one step problem to find the controls might actually be hard, right? So it's, it's small, but um, that like one step min over U of like this action value thing um, will be like non-convex in general. and possibly actually hard. Uh, okay, so here's kind of the, the whole curve story. Uh, basically, the cost of doing dynamic programming blows up in the dimension of the state because we have to represent that V of X somehow. And you can imagine like any, any kind of way you might think about doing this, if it's an arbitrary function, like would involve some kind of like you know, gridding of the state space or representing with some function basis or sample points or whatever. And all of those sort of things blow up like combinatorially in the state dimension. So like it basically just doesn't work after you get past like order 10 dimensions uh, using like kind of classical function approximation ideas. Uh, just just because you have to represent V. Okay, so why? Why do we care then? Okay, so as I like is maybe becoming apparent based on the stuff I've said, doing doing exact dynamic programming, like basically hopeless. 
but doing approximate dynamic programming where you use that function approximator to represent the value function, cost to go function, or that Q function, action value function thing can be really powerful and is the basis for a lot of RL, right? Q learning, blah, blah, blah. Active critic, like all these things are really based uh, therefore on doing some kind of dynamic programming with function approximation, right? For for the um for the the V or the whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, and yeah, basically a ton of like modern RL is based on that. Uh, and then the other thing about this that makes it actually worth talking about is remember we said that like the whole Pontryagin thing is only for deterministic problems. Uh, it turns out like the way to generalize to stochastic control problems is via dynamic program. So, uh, yeah, so basically the dynamic programming stuff we just wrote down, that all generalizes to the stochastic setting. Almost trivially, actually. And um, the way you do it is almost trivially uh, you just like basically just wrap everything we did in expectation operators. So literally all that like recursive minimization stuff, you just slap expectations on all of it. And now you've got like the stochastic version. Uh, and yeah, Pontryagin doesn't generalize, right? That's Okay, that's that story. Let's see, how much time do we have left? We have eight minutes left. Maybe we can do something fun. Okay, any questions about this stuff? We'll be the last little, little, yeah. Yeah, we'll do this later for real, but basically like everywhere I'm doing these like minimizations, anywhere I'm, I'm like any of these optimization problems i i get like rather than the cost it's the expected cost where things are stochastic right we're gonna do it for real uh in a few weeks okay anything else on this yeah they're extremely closely related yeah yeah there's lots to say about this this is probably not the time or place for that conversation <laughs> We can have that conversation later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anything else? Yeah, so the Markov thing and the Bellman thing are like intimately connected, actually. Yeah, like another way of skating this stuff in the stochastic setting, really, you need it. Um, the Bellman thing applies to Markov problems. Okay. Uh, all right, so let's do this last. I think we have time for this. Um, where did it go? Okay, this is fun. So finally, now we can talk about what the Lagrange multipliers are. Now, everyone was wondering about this, right? This is like the burning question in your minds from, uh, from last time. Okay, so... Remember um, when we did the Riccati derivation from the QP, we had like these lambdas in there, right? They were the Lagrange multipliers of the dynamics constraints. And we ended up doing the backward back substitution-y stuff and solving for them, right? If you remember when we did that, uh, they actually had a 2C. Uh, When we were doing that, if you go back and look, uh, we ended up actually getting lambda k equals 
PK times XK. And it's hopefully obvious from like this whole thing that the P's we did in the QP version, I called them P's as like a foreshadowing. They're the same P's we got from the dynamic programming thing. They are the Hessians of this quadratic cost to go. So um, from uh, our DP thing, we have V of X equals one half X transpose PX. And so the obvious kind of conclusion here is that actually these lambdas are the gradient of the cost to go. So this might take a while to chew on. It's, it's kind of deep and cool. Um, it turns out that these lambdas that show up in all these like primal dual uh, formulations of the optimal control problem, when you do trajectory optimization or whatever, um, when you solve those QPs, they're uh, the dynamics multipliers. They're also called the co-states in Pontryagin. These are the gradients of the cost to go. Uh, we did it here just in the LQR case, but it turns out this is a general thing. For, so for nonlinear problems, any kind of problem you want, those lambdas are always the gradient of the cost to go, which is cool. Let's write that down. And yeah, this carries over to the general setting. Not just LQR. Okay, so if anyone had that burning question left over from a while ago, that's the answer. Um, kind of cool. So let's, let's play around with that a little bit. So here's some code stuff. Um, it's the same exact uh, double integrator problem we looked at last time. Just to like do a few of the things from today. Here's that controllability matrix. This problem is like 2D state, 1D input. So N equals two. So the controllability matrix reduces to just B, A, B. It should have rank two. It does. That checks out. Uh, let's see what else we're going to do here. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go back and do the QP version of all this stuff with the same kind of problem as last time. Cost function, we're going to now write out this cost to go thing. That's what that looks like, right? Um, we're going to solve the QP that we did before. Same stuff, dynamics, quadratic cost. Um, this time we're going to actually look at the multipliers because now we know what they are. But here we, so we solved the QP just like last time. And we're also going to do the dynamic programming solution, aka the Riccati solution. And we're going to kind of cache all that stuff and, and just look at some things. So here's the first thing we're going to do just to like show that all this stuff's the same. We're going to plot the um, the solutions, the state solutions for both the QP uh, and the dynamic programming solution, and you know they're on top of each other, the same. They give the same answer. No surprise there. Um, now we're going to plot the P matrix, the cost to go Hessian from dynamic programming, and this we kind of saw this last time with the Ks, but the Ps also converge as you go backwards to a steady state solution because it's an LTI problem, right? So this is that infinite horizon solution. Cool. Um, costs just to like you know belabor this, the costs are exactly the same out to like all the decimal places in double precision. They match, they are exactly the same thing. So whether you use like dynamic programming, you use the QP, it's the same answer. Um, now we're gonna do is uh do the uh, infinite horizon k from the control systems toolbox. We like kind of did this last time. So those match super precisely, you know, like out to nine digits. We can also compute that infinite horizon P matrix from the control two box. That's called dare same thing. And we'll look at it compared to ours from dynamic programming. They match out to like nine, 10 decimal places again. So those match all good. Uh, what are we going to do here? Uh, oh yeah, this is like that whole sub trajectories being optimal thing. So we can actually do a rollout starting at like a later time step. So if we start at like time step 50 and like roll it out from time step 50, these things have to match, right? That was what we were saying and they do. So like those, the tail trajectory matches if I solve it from a sort of halfway point or something, the controls also match exactly, right? So now check this out. So here's the lambda from the QP. I'm just going to pick out a random one from the middle of the trajectory. So it's like time step 50 or whatever, same deal. That's lambda from the QP. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick, I'm going to, you know, auto diff the gradient of my cost to go and check it out. They match like out to a lot of decimal places. Uh, we can also try that with the infinite horizon one, just showing you that like the infinite horizon approximation is pretty good once you get 
far enough out. That's cool. The other thing we can do, just to give you some intuition for what this thing actually is, right? So this is trying to tell you the cost to go, remember, it's the optimal cost starting from some X to get to the goal, right? So if I pick some random state in the middle of the trajectory, the cost to go gradient would be if I start at some random X in the middle of the trajectory, I compute its cost, then I perturb it a little bit, compute a cost, and I like finite diff those, right? That that finite diff gradient, that should be the cost to go gradient, right? If I take two nearby trajectories, compute their costs, right? Solve the trajectory problem, solve the QP, compute their costs, and finite diff them and get a gradient from that. That's what this is, like the sensitivity of like little perturbations in the state, right, to, to that. So if I go do that, I'm going to compute a rollout uh, from some initial state and using that LQR policy, right? And then another one from some nearby slightly perturbed state, right? Like 1e minus 6. And I'm going to go finite diff them. I'm going to compute the cost of this whole trajectory, compute a finite diff gradient. Again, that's that's matching, right? So that's the same thing. That's what it is. If I take some random state, I tweak it a little bit, and I compute the cost to get that solve the whole optimal control problem, right? And I get two costs, and I that's what it's telling me, right? So it's telling you like how the cost will change if you solve the optimal control problem for some little tweak in the state. Cool. All right, that's all I got. Questions? I'll hang out for a little bit, but yeah.